Meanwhile, back in Glastonbury, the forging of Arnanda continued. Now to grind the fuller. And there are a couple of uh, ways of doing this, but I've been told that using this machine is the easier of the two, so I've picked this one. Um, big loud noise. And now, linishing. This is linisher, with which I shall linish. Um, it's a big sanding belt, and then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the very, very slight wobbly edge and try to straighten the profile down both sides. Wish me luck. What I've done now is I've straightened up the two edges. Uh, one of them uh, came nice and straight very easily. The other one, though, had a, a bit of a, an outward curve in it, so it re required removing a fair bit of metal, but it seems to be decently straight now. So now I want to put the profile uh, on this. I'm not going to take it all the way to the central ridge yet, but I'm going to try to take all the hammer marks uh, that I put on the bevels either side. Off. Oh, whoops, I'd been distracted by my own piece to camera and gone back to the way I'd been holding the sword before. Had I continued, I would have got a hollow grind. The correct way to hold the sword for this stage is upright, like this. Unfortunately, in the confusion, my cameraman pressed the record button twice, so there is no footage of my excellent linishing, which is a shame because it was my greatest skill. It's the end of day three, although today's been a very short and comparatively light day. I've not been doing any forging or anything, so there's been not a lot of heat involved, although I did have to stop a couple of times uh, because this was overheating the sword and I could feel it through my gloves. Uh, right, so this is the stage I've got it to on the linisher so far. Um, I've been keeping away from the central ridge. Uh, that's the, the last uh, bit, tricky bit to put in down the, down the center. You can see though on this side, the central ridge has just started to form, uh, which is, uh, that was my uh, signal to stop. On this side, I've probably done a better thing and left a little bit more to work with on this central ridge. So uh, the, the finishing gate is, is in sight now on the blade. A bit more grinding will finish off the central ridge. There's the grinding on the fuller to be done, uh, most of which is going to be done by Tom because it's, been <laughs> it's, it's uh, become plain to me that it's actually really pretty tricky. Uh, and then we have to put an edge on it. Um, it's going to be sharp. Uh, we did wonder about whether to make a blunt sword, whether it should be a sword that looks as though it's sharp but isn't really. Uh, there are advantages of that. It'd be quite nice, for instance, if I'm at some event to be able to hand my sword to a member of the public knowing that it's not sharp. Um, but uh, Tom and I eventually decided that no, what we should be making is a real sword, a real authentic sword. If it's not going to be used for HEMA, if it's not going to be used for, for, for sparring, and it's, it's not, largely because, you know, I've made this, I've gone to a lot of effort and I don't want to then wreck it. Um, it's going to be a real sword, so it's going to be sharp. Um, there is talk of uh, passing laws in Britain, making it illegal to sell people sharp swords, but you can still make your own sharp swords. They're not uh, saying that's going to be legal. So this will be one way to, to get a sharp sword, will be to make it yourself. Um, so uh, it feels like a sword. It feel, and, and I'm really happy with this length. It feels a, a really good length. Uh, I think I might keep a lot of this tang, actually. Uh, the current plan is to put a fishtail pommel on, uh, and so that means that you can grip on the pommel with the, the, the off hand, the left hand, and I think I'm going to go for quite a simple straight cross guard, but maybe just to be a little bit fancy, put a couple of twists in it, maybe a little end, end nodule, just to you know, have something to look at. So, end of day three, uh, I'm happy, this feels like a sword now, and it's even it looks, I hope, you, I hope you agree, quite like a sword. Tom and I have just had the quill-on conversation. 
Uh, so the cross guard, made of two quillons, is going to be made out of this lump of square, quite substantial metal. This is as thick as probably the very thickest part that the, the cross guard is going to be. Uh, we've just uh, marked on three uh, dents in it uh, to show us where the hole that's going to take the tang for the, the blade going through there will be and where the edges of the, uh, the, the depression that the shoulders of the blade go into uh, will be. So it's going to be essentially there. And then this is going to have to be lengthened and I've decided to get a little bit fancy and, and put in some twists. But uh, in order for those twists to show up nicely, give us the so-called barleycorn effect, uh, we're going to leave um, a square section so that those twists show. And then I'd quite like the ends of the quillons to be rounded, to, be, to have a globe at the end, uh, rondels if you like, uh, roundels. Um, because I like the quillons to be blunt, because they're going to be they're going to be there. I'm going to be walking around with them, and things are going to be catching on them. And if they're square and spiky, I'm going to get my cloak snagged on them and so forth. So a nice rounded end to the quillons will be a very comfortable way of carrying or carrying on. Now, we've also had the conversation about what size should the uh, the entire thing be. Now, this is going to be a bastard sword, and uh, a hand goes there up against the. Uh, quillons and don't forget that, that we've got to take into account the fact that it's going to be wearing gauntlets so my hands will be slightly bigger though exactly how much bigger we don't really know um, and the other hand is going to be gripping on the end of the uh, grip plus the pommel and of course you can actually put the the, the fat part of the pommel into the center of the, the lower hand uh, and use the sword that way um, how much room should we leave? Uh, it's, it's, all, um, uh, it, it's all a matter of judgment. Um, another uh, question is whether to have a widening uh, in, the, in the grip. Some, some have a, a wider bit looking something like that. And if so, where should that go? Should it go at the bottom of uh, the right hand to stop your hand sliding down the grip, uh, acting, if you like, uh, a bit like a pommel? Or should it perhaps go in the middle of, of the hand so your fingers can grip around that? But again, that does the same job. It uh, uh, helps you grip the sword and stops the sword sliding accidentally through your fingers. Um, uh, so uh, that's another issue. So there's something blocking the airflow and the fire's got a bit cold. So I can feel something in there and it's a clinker. This isn't cold, it's like molten metal. <laughs> I have to push that back in. And yeah, quite a small one. I thought it was bigger. But yeah, that is our enemy. Eventually, you fill a bin with the stuff. I have here two blades. This one will be mine, and I've done most of the work on it. And this one was the one that Tom used to demonstrate to me what I needed to do to make this one. Uh, but Tom will be ending up with this one, and he didn't want a bastard sword the same length as mine. So he made his very slightly longer. Can you see? It's all of about three inches longer. And here's the weird thing. It's only three inches longer, and yet it's a completely different weapon. And I could see right from the start that it was a different weapon. When he was the other side of the workshop picking up one of these swords, I could tell immediately that he had picked up his own because it just looked so huge. This is a long sword. And when I hold it, admittedly it doesn't have its grip on it yet, but I can hold the tang. When I hold it, this feels like a long sword. No way would I want to use this in one hand. It's, to me, this is really slow and awkward and hurts my wrist. This is a long sword, absolutely. And we've been looking at it and, and uh, we both agreed that extending the fuller on this would somehow just suit this blade. It's a different blade. It feels different in the hand. This one, this is what I asked for. I wanted a bastard sword and this feels in, in my hand like a bastard sword. It's only three inches shorter but it handles quite differently. Uh, the fuller ends here. This is a type 18. It's got the straight uh, the, the, the straight sides, that one's got a very slight curve on it, which eh, stri strictly speaking means it's not a Type 18 anymore. Um, it is an extraordinary thing. As soon as 
I see a weapon like this in someone's hand, I can see what his reach is, which is a very important thing. When you're trying to judge an opponent, how can he get me? Am I within his measure? So when he's standing here, it's not just the length of the blade. You've also got to take into account the length of his arms and what sort of footwork technique he's likely to use. And yes, as soon as I saw this in someone's hands, even from a distance, yep, it's not a long sword. This is a bastard sword. And it's one of those weird um, things that's extremely difficult to define. There is no absolute cutoff point. You cannot say a sword such and such a length is a bastard sword, but if it's three inches longer, that makes it a long sword. And yet, when you handle an individual sword, you feel, um, you feel it in your hand, you feel its balance. Uh, you very often can tell. And with this, I'm much happier using this in one hand. This doesn't hurt anything like as much. And if I got right up to you, start half-swording you, um, I, I feel much more able to, to use this in the bastard sword fashion. So, yeah, I've made a bastard sword. I've got this and this standing by to put the shoulder slot in. Tom is uh, ready with the tongs. Um, this is a critical stage. If I put this in the wrong place, uh, we'll have wasted a piece of metal, which will be a shame. What do you reckon? Oh, it's decently central. It's pretty good. I don't know how well you can see this, but there's a little nick in the center of this tool here, which um, will mark the center of the hole, which I'm going to have to punch later. So I'll have to see the tiny little indentation left in the hot metal uh, and judge the center of that by eye for putting the hole through the middle for the blade. Couple more. Couple more, all right. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay. We have our shoulder slot. So now I put down this and pick up this. This will put the hole all the way through for the blade. And you see it, uh, it goes straight for a bit and then it widens out. Um, so I'm gonna have to hammer all the way through to put a hole in and then go a little bit further to create a bit of a widening uh, which will accommodate the width of the tang. Uh, it's a little bit approximate. I've been told that it's best to go not quite far enough so that the blade is too tight, rather than to go too far, uh, so that the, uh, the blade is too loose in the quillons, because tightening it up is a swine. <laughs> I can't see it. I can't see it, that looks like about the middle. Yeah, you're on it there, yeah. Whoops, that didn't sound good. Stop. Nice one. Yeah, it looks good. With this one, we're going to put it over the hardy hole, that's the larger square one, and then I'm going to try to bash all the way through to daylight. Oh, oh yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Enough, or? More. That's quite clearly through. And is that the route as deep as you want? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Off comes Steve. Right. Okay. So now we have a hole for the tang and a slot for the shoulder of the blade. Before risking the application of my incompetence on my cross guard, I practiced putting a spherical end on a piece of scrap steel. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. It can so be done. Seems I can do it then. Yeah. Now to show that it was a fluke. Now to work the precious artifact. 
I was a bit timid, so I didn't speed up the video. Making a different noise. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice weight. There you go. Jobs again. Reckon? Yeah. Right. No, this bit. Oh yeah. Uh, about there? Yeah. Now, brimming with confidence, I could time-lapse away. I can do it! Now doing another cut-off, something which I never found easy. As you can see, I've heated the wrong bit of the piece. Ah! Oh dear, that was rubbish. Okay, second heat. Give it a few hard whacks. Uh, yeah, I'm not very happy with that. I've managed to bend it and I didn't get very far. And it's not even a very straight slot. Hey ho! Oh, it's looking better now. Uh, is that a good way of doing it? Yeah, go for it. Lovely. Hey. Victory! This is a pair of tin snips. Now then, this putting a round bit on the end business has turned out to be a huge complication because if it just tapers and comes to the usual sort of end and you make it a little bit too long, that's easy, you just cut it shorter. Uh, or if it's a little bit too short, that's easy, you just hammer it a bit more and draw it out longer. But if you've put a big blob on the end and you've made it too long, how are you going to get it shorter again? You can't. So um, I've, I've made things um, requiring of more skill. You see, I didn't give it any thought. Um, I suppose if the absolute worst comes to the worst, we could just cut the round bits off or just hammer them flat. Oh, wow, I got there quick. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty even. Quick straighten. Yeah, it doesn't want to be much longer, it does it? It doesn't, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Fair. And your philosophy was that that distance, is this hot, cold enough to? Yeah, yeah. presumably. Uh, that distance there similar should that. be similar to that distance there. Yeah. Grinding. making the round bits rounder. If I just turn it round, you'll see that the hole is not actually bang in the centre, but uh, I'm told that this will give the sword character. And now, the twisting, another crucial stage. <laughs> Completely unnecessary deck. Well, a, you know, it gives a little bit of grip, perhaps, to the cross guard, uh, but it's mostly decoration. And we've just established that we don't twist it three times round for, for three lines, it's three quarters of a turn. OK, here we go. Yep. <laughs> 
Because I had to get past the spheres at the end of the quillons, I couldn't have the tool waiting ready at the correct setting, so valuable seconds ticked away as I fumbled the thing into position. Is it meant to grip completely or is yeah, that? Yeah, that'd be the, fine. That's close enough. Okay. So, are you yeah. sure that's enough? Yeah, go. One. Ah, uh, no, it's, it's not gripping. Ass. And a quarter. Is that it? I can't see. You need a, a little bit more to get it to line up. Okay. All right. It's, it's not quite straight, but is it not? It's not. It's not quite straight that way. It needs. To, to, to. Oh, what? It's been bent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fine. That happens. Okay. We'll do that afterwards. Twists. Take two. The other half. So now I want to go. Hang on. I went. went so now I want to go anti-clockwise. All right. Okay, so he's uh, dipping up to the bit that he wants twisting. So he's uh, cooling everything that we want to stay still. Right. Oh, great time for it to slip. Okay, that's not happening. Grip, you swine. Okay, so this time anti-clockwise. One and a quarter. Oh, it's tighter than the other one. Okay, it's a little bit characterful. There was only this much heat left. We uh, took too long. Just fumbled it a little bit. Final straighten with a mallet on wood so as not to spoil the ridges of the twists dunk, and there we are.